Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Dice Tower Daily Chat. I am your, your guest host tonight. I'm Brian Drake, and I have a very, very, very special guest who I, I love just to get to talk with and, and chat about games and all such of that. Uh, Emerson Matsucci, you guys know him from, from all sorts of games and stuff, and just, just all around nice guy. So, Emerson, welcome. Thanks for coming on and taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. This is great. No, absolutely. So, basically, if you haven't been here before, what we do is we give you you as the chat are kind of in control. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of manage the questions a little bit and pitch some to Emerson, and we'll give him your best you know your best questions and ask him all sorts of great things. Uh, we always get a food question in Emerson. I don't know if you're a foodie or not, but we always <laughs> always manage to have food go uh, go in there. So, uh, sure. I, I'm gonna I I'm gonna start out uh, uh, right out of the gate actually. Uh, with something that I like to ask as and when I talk to designers in general, because the creative process is so much fun. So when we do this illusion with, I think we talked about this before, actually at Dice Tower Con last year, we do a thing with a knife, right? And so the idea was we do this knife roulette. When I come up with illusions or Carla comes up with illusions, we say, okay, do we work forwards or backwards? So I wanted to get your take on this. Do you work from the beginning of a project to the end? Or do you work with end result and go, okay, I want to do, I want to have a game about a coral reef and let's work backwards. Like how does that, what's your preferred way? Oh, okay. That's a, you know, that's actually a really good question because most of the time people always ask theme or mechanics right. or like, how do you, you know, where do you get inspiration? But that's, a, that's actually a really unique question of whether you start from the forward or back. And uh, a lot of times you, I would say that I think I need to know what the end looks like. Like I have an idea of what the end product should look like. Now that evolves right. as you're as you're going through the design. Since I think I have at least a vision of what I see as the final product, so I kind of imagine already what the final product will be or what what my goal is. So I always have a goal in mind. Right. So perhaps I I am a, I am a end first thinker. That's that's what's funny that you say that because that's that's exactly what we do. We we do. Uh, there's another thing. It's we call it a chair prediction. Where basically the end of it is like, okay, I want to have this prediction that's been on stage and everybody. Uh, the I know where you've chosen to set. You've made two choices that I know ahead. And so we go, okay, how do we get there? All right. So here's the end goal. Now let's work towards uh -huh. it. Like. Uh, I asked that question of Glenn Drover recently. I said, well, you know, what do you do? And he's like, well, it changes some. And he's like, we had this whole game planned out for, I can't remember what game he told me, but like the theme was totally different. It was around the world in 80 days, all Jules Verne sort of stuff. And then it's, gosh, I wish I could remember what he told me it was, but it's just funny to see how game, oh, it was a pirate's game now. So he has, he still has his goal in mind, but then he kind of worked towards it. So creative process, man. It's, it's just fun. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got, man, we've got a lot of great people in chat checking out already. So, uh, t -t 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 -t. pulling a card again, pulling a card. What is your favorite? Yeah, let's do that. That's, that's a good one. Actually. I want to ask you this because one of the things that we, uh, where I actually met you was at a con. What is yeah. your favorite kind of, uh, con experience? Now that could be a specific or that could be like, no, I like this when I go to cons. I like to get a foot massage. I like to, you know what I'm saying? No, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I can't say I've had a foot massage at a, at a convention yet, though. But we need to start uh, that. Put that in Emerson's rider right there. Yeah, I've got, got to put that on my to-do list. That's right. Uh, get a foot massage. It'll be on my bucket list there. Uh, but it's actually my favorite part is actually seeing the people. Yeah. So, like for instance, going to conventions, uh, getting to see other designers that I've built friendships with, uh, some designers that like I aspire to become you know more like for instance you know like eric lang is is one of those rock star designers right. that i always look up to because he's great uh ignacy trevichek is also another fantastic and he's like one of those guys that's just multi-talented he runs a publishing company right. and he's a phenomenal designer uh so and i could just keep naming lots and lots of designers like isaac vega and and uh, jerry hawthorne and now, all, all, all these people that I've had uh, built up relationships with. So I always look forward to seeing these people. And also, I, it's really cool to actually see what they're working on and get a glimpse of it. So I feel like I'm in a special club when I get to see like these <laughs> objects that they're working on and get like a first glimpse of it. And then this way, it gives me a little bit of pride when I tell my friends, hey, I got to play test that before right. it came out. It's, it's really cool. 
Well, that's where I saw Foundations of Rome was at uh was it somewhere it was a comedy <laughs> and they were like carrying around this coffin. I was like, what is that game? They're like, oh no, it's, it's Foundations of Rome. Don't worry about it. I was like, I'm very, I want to see that like right now. So, oh, no, oh, yeah. oh, exclusive. Look at this, Dice Tower, dude. <laughs> dude oh. <laughs> uh, like so. On our merch table, when we sell T-shirts, we have you know those just black Target cubes that you buy. They're like thirteen. Yeah. We we put a T-shirt over that. That's what I thought that was when I saw it. I was like, oh, that can't be a game. <laughs> that's got <Yeah>. to <laughs> be uh, an advertisement. But uh, man, that's so cool. Uh, that's yeah. that's fun. Just like just seeing that. But yeah, and again, that goes to theme versus uh, versus stuff. Like I love an abs. Would you call that abstract? Would you call it more placement? What, what do you even call it? Oh, uh, I mean, it's a city building, but yeah. I guess I've abstracted it so much that uh, I guess some people could see it as an abstract game because it is really distilled down. Right. So uh, it's it kind of follows like the formula with like Century and Reef, where mm -hmm. it is really, really distilled down to a very simple set of rules. In fact, like we were always aiming for like ticket to ride weight rules, where right. in ticket to ride, there's only three things that you can do, right? It's true. So, sure. so in this game, there's just three things you can do on your turn, so... Uh, but we're hoping that it is, uh, it's a little bit like a gateway plus. So it's something yeah. that you can grow into. And also we've added some, especially with this Kickstarter, we've actually added quite a, quite a bit more content to it. So, oh, nice. Yeah. So we'll uh, start off as like a very, um, like a very entry weight, uh, uh, strategy game. It's now become a little bit more fleshed out. So now I think it, uh, fits the range between like an entry level, to like a light medium weight euro style game now. Th that's interesting though, because that's such a make or break range for people that you can get a lot of people to play Ticket to Ride, but that yeah. next step, I mean, I mean, you you take somebody you just play Ticket to Ride, and you're like, hey, do you want to play Twilight Imperium? They're like, I, I want to go away from you right now. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> about, but like that next step is so important. Like, okay, everybody's comfortable with Ticket to Ride. It's such a phenomenal game. Um, yeah, okay, what's that next step? And and I that's what I love about uh, the Century games is they're well. You've got a different range almost in each one. Like they, yes. they, it's different, but it's, it's that's what's that's fun. Uh, people are, are blowing up about uh, Century just anyway, just how much fun it is. So, oh, here's a great question. So, uh, are you are you a video gamer? I mean, I would assume I so I because you know we'll talk about. <laughs> I to, yeah, I don't get to play as much uh, as I as I like. Uh, I'm trying to do more tabletop stuff with. Mm -hmm. Actually, we've been doing a lot of stuff with my kids. My kids are like. I'm really, really thankful. My kids are really into board games, so yeah. I haven't touched as many video games as much. So, but yeah, at uh, you know, in my history, I played. I, I was a big uh, video game fanatic. Yeah, the, and that's what Kabuki Kid asked: Is Emerson, have you found any other great games since the Death Stranding recommendation? Which oh yes, I have Death Stranding, and I'm a fan of carrying boxes around. I never thought I would be, but I'm like, this is fantastic. I have to balance yes. my weight. Like to, to yeah. this side, I don't want to fall over. there's something incredibly as when you describe it, it doesn't sound fun, no. but when you play, it, there's something incredibly satisfying, and the story is absolutely. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. I love it. That love it's it. you're talking about an eerie world too. Like, man, you, you the first time you see that handprint just appear, yes. uh, it's like, whoa, what are we doing? <laughs> right, like, right, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a super tense game too, uh -huh. right? Which yeah, is a good so I, that, that right there is a yes. good emotion to get into gaming. It's tension, not not fear yes. or horror, but actual tension. And you're just like, I don't I, I think I need to take a break. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Well, a lot of video games now, you you play a protagonist that is just a uh uh, I was about to say, um, uh, I don't know how PG the term is, so I'm actually going to just throw it out the window and uh, say you are. We're going to restart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're a BA basically, right? Mm -hmm. So you are super strong. You're so capable. You know, you you have a dominating advantage over your your AI controlled opponents. But uh, I, I really appreciate Death Stranding in that you, for the most part, you're a normal guy, right? So it's a lot more easier to like really put yourself in Sam Porter's shoes right. because he doesn't have superpowers or anything like that. The only ability he really has is that the you know those supernatural things don't don't kill him outright, right? Right. But no. other than that, he's a normal guy. Mm -hmm. And that, well, that but that's such an interesting thing when it comes to our pop culture in general right now, with the yeah. with the the issues of creativity that we're having as, as a culture, we're having trouble creating characters that are interesting because we're afraid to give them flaws. You don't want to yeah. give a character, and, and, but but perfect characters are boring. You, I mean, it, yeah. if you can't learn or you can't find a hero's arc if they're already at the end of their journey, you know. Right. Right. Exactly. 
So that's uh, yeah. that's something that, yeah, that's that's what I really like. It's funny, and, and and like you say, Solid Snake is like that, a little bit headstrong, you know. I don't know if you've played this right. game called Metal Gear Solid. It's pretty phenomenal, but <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm a big fan of, of that uh, as well. So uh, we'll yeah. we'll touch base on that in a minute because I've got to ask you about that, of course. But sure. All right. Sure. So the Meeple Minded has the question that it's a pretty popular question. It always gets asked to designers, but I want to ask you in a little bit different way. So it says, how did you get into board gaming? What made you design your own game? So I'll, I want to know if you have that flash of genius moment where you went from, well, I guess, first of all, did you play games before you designed games? Yes. Okay. Yes. But not not for too long. I mm. think that my journey from start getting back into tabletop, I was really into tabletop games when I was younger. Right. So I played uh, board games uh, like, my favorite at that time was called uh, Shogun, which mm-hmm. is uh, now it's called Samurai Swords or Ikusa, but it's uh, it's different from the Queen game Shogun. There was a I think it was like Mil- not Milton Bradley, it was Avalon Hill, right? Uh, but it was an older one. I really loved that game, and then also that was the time when I was getting into like Dungeons and Dragons, so I was really just head deep into all kinds of uh, tabletop games, uh, gotten into Magic the Gathering, all all that kind of stuff. And then I guess from there I transitioned into like video games, and it was only probably oh gosh now it's now it's been a little while but probably about twelve or fifteen years ago I can't remember the exact time but I got reintroduced to board games with Settlers of Catan that yeah. actually drew me back in, and it was actually one of Tom's Vassal's review. Oh, that's funny because I watched I watched his Dice Tower review I was like wow this guy's got so much energy and so much passion, so I said you know what let me. Well, let me look at this, you know. <laughs> I went out, I, I, I bought uh, Sellers of Catan, and I played it with a friend of mine who got me into World of Warcraft. So uh, I sat down with, you know, my, my girlfriend and I and his fiance and him, and we sat down and we played, and it was just such an enjoyable experience. And you know, after we played, we said, let's play that again. Exactly. That yeah. And then after that, I was like, what's the symbol here? This uh, this red pawn with the little, little red <laughs> like Spiel de Jar, what, what is what this? What does that thing? mean? I, yeah. I, started, I started looking for other game boxes with that label on it just because I thought maybe there's some kind of an association. Maybe this game is like that game just because it has that symbol. And so I started, that's how I started my whole journey down that rabbit hole. Right. And I guess it wasn't too long after that that I said, hey, you know, I've you know, I always wanted to get into like game design. Mm-hmm. So I said, hey, let me try doing it with a, uh, a tabletop game. Let me just make a card game. So. So that's sort of how I started my journey. Yeah, that's it. But that's interesting, though. Like it, it's it's almost like that nugget was already there. Of course, video games used to sneak in uh, board games on us anyway, like Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre. Those oh, are yeah. really uh, board games, just in oh, video yeah. game and like cool. civilization stuff. But um, yeah. yeah, but that's uh, those those are just such. But but you're you're right though. We're seeing that meeple and being like, wait a minute, there's a world that exists where these games are not just like rare; they're very common. It's it's like wrestling kayfabe when you learn how to like you, you learn. Wait a minute, are you telling me that Hulk Hogan's not really a real person? He's like he's just an act. He's playing a character. When you find <laughs> out that that world is open and you go, wait, board game because how many games on there? And it's right, right, yeah. and then and then you walk into an actual local game store for the first time and you're like. You feel a little bit like Willy Wonka, you know, or not yes, Willy Wonka, yeah. but but that's uh so so you like the Avalon Hill type stuff when you, when growing up, and so that yeah. puts you. I don't want to ask how old you are on a stream. We don't want to date you that much, but what? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be 45 next month. Look at that, young. And did you hear, by the way, folks? Dice Tower totally responsible for everything Emerson Matsuji does. Is it, you heard it here first. For, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, uh, it's, um, that's so okay. Now here's my question though, as far as because you're always creating, you're always making things, but do you ever get to take a time to get out of that and, and play games strictly for enjoyment now? You know what I'm saying? Like, is, or is it always work, I suppose? Yeah, yeah. actually, no, that's a really, really good question because like, there are times when I have the intention of just going in, just having fun, just playing games, and I'm always finding myself in the back of my mind I'm thinking about the mechanics. Can we use those right. mechanics? And What if we did this? And I start asking myself questions that, then I kind of take mental notes up, and the next thing I know, I'm starting to write stuff in my notebook right. about, hey, maybe this, you know, let me catalog this mechanism that I haven't seen before, right? And then people are like, Emerson, it's your turn. Would you just take a turn and go? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right. Like, what kind of permutation that could take in a different form, right? Right, right, exactly, exactly. Because every mechanism has like different value. Mm-hmm. It's almost like every mechanism in board games is like a function, right? Right. 
And each of those functions has parameters that you can put into it. Like for instance, worker placement has like, right. well, how many workers? Mm -hmm. uh, is it, are the, are the spots for the workers, are they uh, mutually exclusive? Yeah. Right. And not only mutually like, exclusive to each other, but to your own workers. Can you put, right, to, right, exactly. you know. Right, exactly. Or can you can you push another worker out mm -hmm. where, but you have to put in more workers and things like that. There's all these variations that you can have with it. The workers could be dice, you know, so right. the dice numbers will allow you to displace another person or things like that. There's just so many different variations for every mechanism, right? Well, and things that we don't even think of, because I, 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 I think you and I talked off air one other time about... Um, Carl and I are, are, are designing just for, it's a labor of love. If, if anything ever happens with it, great. If nothing ever happens with it, we'll have done a labor of love. We're, it's, it's a work placement game all about running your own VHS rental store back in the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. And th we, we came up with goal cards, right? And mm -hmm. we're sitting down to start play testing and we're like, yeah, we'll figure out how many points the goal cards are worth. I'm still like, wait a minute. These are things that are so simple as like goal cards mid game, but yet, how, is it three? Is it four? You know what? And there's a big ratio there between the amount of work you put in for each one. Right, right, right. And yeah. that's crazy. But yeah, I think in that same conversation, I said that if you guys need help with actually mathing out what those uh, what those valuations should be, I said, you know, always, you know, feel free, don't hesitate, just you know, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> shoot me an email. Definitely gonna take advantage of that. <laughs> well, and so what happened was it went on delay for a long time. Uh, just us, just being travel busy, and now that we're home. Uh, we picked it back up uh, about two weeks ago, and we ran through some more play tests. And it's it's funny how you just you can feel better about something, I guess. And so now now I've been like three D printing like uh, little game shelves and stuff like that. That one came out oh, solid. Nice. That was a problem because it's like very heavy, and I could throw it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's it's fun. Just like little little things like that. That's um, great. I, I, it's it's makes it makes feel like other people want to design games oh, yeah. too because I think it's a fantastic creative outlet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and the so. creative outlet is something that I, I really think everybody has. Even the person that you're like, that's not a creative person. They're only analytical. Some way, mm -hmm. some form, some fashion, they have a creative outlet they have to get out. I mean, that's why I started doing video reviews. And I'm sure it's partially why you went into game design was not just to go, hey, I'm going to make a career out of this. It was more like, and I could be wrong, but at first, I just want to do this because I want to do this. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's a, it is a creative outlet. And it's also one of those things that... Uh, I always kind of wrestle with this too. Creative things, uh, so creative endeavors, creative projects, and creative products, right? There's mm -hmm. actually a good amount of analytical research that's done, right? A lot right. of, especially for like game design, we actually have a lot of logic and a lot of math mm -hmm. that goes into a game. And so it's almost like, uh, and also when I think about art too, because there's always that comparison about, okay, design versus art. Sure. You know? Where are the boundaries between them? What, what, how are they defined? What are the relationships between them? But in a way, there's a lot of parallels because even with art, when you look at, say, a phenomenally photorealistic painting right. that, you know, say, a 18th century painter has painted, right? But they need to have, like, an understanding of how light interacts with right. pigments, uh, how radiosity works. There's so many different concepts in terms of how our eyes process visual data that the artist does need to know that. Mm -hmm. And it could be through completely through intuition, right? right? So they could be genius in terms of, they understand this naturally. But for instance, if I were to do some art, so now, you know, as I try to, to draw something, and I, at one point I tried to do some concept art, but then I realized there is a lot of analytical thinking that goes into doing a piece of art. So regardless of how, how creative or analytical something is, but it seems like anything uh, anything worth doing has uh, almost an equal amount of both, you know. Absolutely, you guys an equal amount of both. It could it could lean in one side or the other, but yeah, depending I feel like on. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of art in science. Like you'll see like very elegant formulas, and and I know in programming, like when uh, colleagues had taken a look at my code and I look at theirs, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things, one of the best compliments you give is that you could say that the code is elegant, right? Yeah, right? which is a subjective <laughs> term, right? Yeah. And the same the, the side with the art, too, is that there's a lot of science that goes into the art. So I feel like there is actually a very blurred definition between art and design. Oh, absolutely. And, well, you can appreciate art uh, and design and gaming, too, by do, do you get lost in the fact that it's it's there for a reason? or You know what I'm saying? Or does it stand out? Um, little things like that. But even, even then, you're talking about you have to know, okay, 
is is even the small little piece going to be distracting to the eye or is it going to actually forward right. the narrative of the game and when i say narrative of the game i don't mean like gloomhaven you're literally doing a narrative i mean but even even a game like reef has a narrative it's just not quite the same way it's a, it's a narrative structure of you are doing this thing and does each piece of the game go towards making that narrative or does it pull you out for a moment because the moment you get pulled out you're like ah, what are we doing here you know right, right. i'm not saying reef has that i'm saying, I'm saying <laughs> Well, I think every every game really does have like a model, a logical mm -hmm. model or a mathematical model that really underpins all the mechanisms of the game. And then the narr the the theme of it is to kind of help. Like what you do is that it distracts the player from right. what's going on under the covers. Mm -hmm. right? So in a way, you're kind of misdirecting and trying to uh, not necessarily hide the map, but make it to where that's not the central focus. So similar to a piece of art where mm -hmm. you have your like your focal points. And you want to keep the focal points on the areas of the game that you want the players to explore, right? And right. not necessarily just point out, here Here are the math formulas mm -hmm. you need to know to make right. optimum moves. Here's your Nash <laughs> equilibrium chart. You exactly. Know, for, for, your for your whole decision matrix. It's You know, you want to hide that as much as possible and right. give the players that feeling of just exploring that theme, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that's what's interesting to me about board gaming and video gaming, the fact that they are very similar in what they do, but it, it's almost like the the coding of board gaming is all, you could literally walk someone over and show them the coding of it, if, if that makes sense, versus like, you know, it literally digits and numbers in, in HTML, or whatever it is. I don't even know how to code. Right, right. You know? <laughs> but like the coding of exactly. board gaming is, it's so different in the sense that there are so many more manual steps, I guess, if that makes any sense. <laughs> right, yeah, uh, there's there's definitely some parallels between uh, designing a video game and designing a uh, board game. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still I still feel like I'm quite novice on both sides of the fence, but I do I do dabble on both sides too. So I've actually uh, one of the things I have been doing during this game mm -hmm. uh, is actually trying to brush up on my programming skills again. So I've, I've gotten a little bit rusty, so I tried to I got back into uh, doing a little bit of coding as well so mm. uh, and just thinking about okay what ideas like what game ideas are more suited to like a video game medium right. versus say like a board game medium and uh, and I remember there was a one uh, one episode of the going analog podcast and I don't mean oh. to plug someone else no that's great it's a fun show mm -hmm. it's a, yeah it's it's a great show and I remember uh, Tim Schafer who was uh, talking about and he 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 runs a, a video game company and he says you know when he tried to design a board game he says it's really difficult right because there are certain you know leverages he had of, of making a video game where you could hide mm -hmm. all the stuff you can find you could hide all the intricacies of how much damage calculations work and you know how movement happens how ai works you can hide all of that but with a right. board game it's laid laid it's right there. in front of you, you <laughs> yeah you really can't hide anything right the mechanisms are all there right in front of you. So like you said, it's, you know, it, you're showing them the entire model in front of them when you make a board game. No, that's true. But it, no, that brings us to a very controversial topic in gaming since about 2014, really since the 80s, because I had the Clue VHS game, by the way. But uh, there was uh, <laughs> uh, the, the idea of using technology in games, you know, in apps and things like that. There, there's a huge contingent of people like, no, I don't want your peanut butter near my chocolate. You know what I mean? But at, at the same time, you're like, wait a minute. But in, in Mansions of Madness, you can hide some of the, the things that you would have to set up now, or, you know, other things like that. So uh, yeah. so give us your unfiltered opinion on, on technology and gaming. Should we, shouldn't we do it? Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, this all falls on him if it goes. <laughs> this goes no, I'm no. just kidding. <laughs> no, I think no, I think it's a fantastic question. I got the privilege of asking uh, some some uh, people that I admire and really respect their knowledge on on this topic, and it's it's really interesting that the we have the option now to have more digital integration. Right. And the part that I always find difficult is okay, where do I draw the line? Because I'll give an example. So I was thinking of making a sort of a, a tabletop game. So think of like a skirmish style okay. game. So a skirmish, you know, one-on-one -on -one skirmish style game uh, with a small squadron against an, uh, another opponent. And, but a lot of the bookkeeping is then uh, held within the, the app or some digital implementation mm -hmm. that's keeping track of doing all the bookkeeping, keeping track of damage, all the stats, and everything like that. And I thought, okay, well, you know, if it's doing that, then all the cards, we can integrate all the cards into the app so then people don't need to fiddle with the cards. Right. It's like, okay, well, if we do that, then you know what? We can actually, you know, have the whole board, 
right, in the app as well. So you can have, keep track of the figures because it needs to know that information anyway. Right. Instead of having them enter the position of their figures into the app, why not just have everything integrated to the app? And I got to the point where I said, there's no more components. Yeah, like I've made a game. The app. <laughs> you open a box and inside is an iPad. It's, it's amazing. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> no. So I think the tricky part is, okay, how do we find a, a tabletop, a strictly tabletop experience, something that a digital uh, medium couldn't replicate, right? Right. So take the things that are just uh, irreplaceable in the tabletop environment. Right. But how does the the app enhance and gives a different and new experience? And that's always like a really, really difficult thing because I always end up finding that whatever I choose, I can I end up putting everything into the app out right. of convenience. Yeah, and so finding you know? that line of, okay, wait a minute. Yes, we could do it out of convenience, but is there an elegant way to handle it analogly that that we that we just go with instead yeah it might be a little bit more work book keeping book keeping wise but uh right. that's that's got to be a struggle because the temptation's there right the temptation now we'll just we'll just give that to the app you know <laughs> we're all, yeah, we'll it's, almost, it's almost like the the app is like a black hole where and i don't mean that in negative yeah. sense but just, just everything just can a, get no, sucked it, into it yeah it, it starts off small so you give it some small respect like for any voice active uh scenario so you can it adds music and things mm -hmm. it's like but at a certain point, once you put like, games larger, it starts to, to grow, and then more and more of opponents start to fall event horizon of that app, and now right. it's it's basically taken everything, and now everything is in the app. You have no more tabletop presence anymore. And then Sam Neill is trying to kill you. No, sorry, a little event horizon. <laughs> <laughs> Super lame. <laughs> spoiler. I don't, is that a spoiler for a 30-year-old movie? I don't know. I don't know if that yeah. counts or not. But. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. yeah I, I'd say 30 good uh, sexual yeah, it's to cut off. You can't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's yeah. funny. But, I mean, there are, there are so many games that, that do it well, and then there are sometimes you go, I don't, I think I would rather have had this on the table. Now, some of them, um, I, I think, like, I, have, have you played Mansion of the Menace? Yes, yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, I, it's one of my favorite games, but I, I feel like there was a choice, man, and I think they may, maybe even talked about this in the design journal at some point, where they said, okay, no, we're not, we're purposely not going to show you monsters on the map. A, we could, but we're not right. going to, so that you, you do have to have it. And some people, their, their gripe at the time, or I'm not saying gripe, their, their kind of issue at the time was, well, why do we even need the board then? But I've never sat down with that game, especially having played first edition, and thought, nah, I want to go back. You know, <laughs> it's, like it's, it's just such a good uh, mixture of the two. So, um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think the, an app is great for anything that requires like a moderator mm -hmm. or a dungeon master or game master. I think the app is going to be an invaluable tool to help where you have you have like one role, like a dungeon master uh, moderator, where it's not it's not the most fun role. And you're right. really there to do the bookkeeping and so far. I think that's where an app can really add a lot of value for games that have that kind of a structure. Yeah, absolutely. And the good thing is you, you then get to be... Uh, um, you can take the game, and make it more solo or much more cooperative. At that point, too, you're not you're not running into that. Well, I don't want to play the chisel and uh, uh, the detective game. That, that game's really cool. Yeah, City of Angels. Yeah. yeah, it's like uh, I want to be I want to be part of the story. But the good news is too like, yeah. and there are a lot of games that do solo well. But there's yeah. some where the solo mod is so complicated that it's like I don't want to go through this chart and figure out what I'm supposed to do right here. So there's uh, there's tricky things. Like somebody mentioned a game called Nemo's War over here in the chat a few minutes ago, and I actually I just reviewed it recently. But it does a really good um, it does a really good implementation of a solo in the sense that all your information is on the board. You just have to look a couple different places. So so that's kind of similar in the same same vein. But the app can just handle it like that. So. Um, actually, based on your review, I actually mm -hmm. wanted to go and get uh, Nemo's War. That's from Victory Point Games, right? It is, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and somebody gave me grief. They said, why, why would you call them GMT game style uh, chits? I was like, because there's a couple that feel like GMT style chits. And it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, but, uh, but it's, I mean, it's, it was really cool looking like it. Um, I was, I'm not really cool looking. It was really cool on the table. I, I, I'll be honest. Look, full transparency here, folks. There are times when, it, when it's time to review a game and I'm like, oh, I got to play this game and review it. You know, not because I'm not looking forward to it. Because it's late at night and I'm tired. I got this one set up at the table pretty late when I started playing it the first time. And I was like, nah, I'm going to keep playing this. It's, it's interesting stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so a couple of people asking about, and, and I asked you beforehand, there was nothing you couldn't talk about project-wise. I don't and we didn't, Reef, second edition, Reef 2.0, is that, people are asking uh -huh. What, what's they're saying what can you tell us about or what can't you tell us about i guess or or things like that and again i'm just i'm phrasing their questions because i'm 
I'm in the loop on a lot of stuff, but uh, but you. Yeah, yeah. As, as far as I know now, uh, uh, I just want to put full a disclaimer out there that right. as a designer, usually I'm like the last to know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So it's like, it's um, mostly, yeah, it's mostly because it's so hard. There's like so many uh, news outlets, and also there's just a lot of things that are going on. And uh, the folks who are like the, the big fans that are always keeping their ear on the train tracks, right? Oh, you know, always get the, the news. Usually they end up telling me, hey, did you hear about this or hear about that? So I usually, I'm usually like the, the second or third in line in terms of getting the news. That's what I mean. <laughs> when, it comes to, when it comes to Reef's second edition, though, I was, I was told that it's, uh, it's an update on the art, but I think most of it, it's mostly coloring as far yeah. as I can tell. So I just saw a couple of uh, <laughs> images that were sent to me, and I think it's just the coloring. Right. And I think it's really just to address the, the heavy criticism in the beginning when we first released Reef was that the colors made it look like a Fisher-Price uh, oh. toy. And I so, like that part of it, actually. <laughs> I like the way it looks. <laughs> yeah, some, some people really enjoy the, the yeah. fact that it's very colorful. It's mm -hmm. eye-catching on the table. Uh, so I think some people really enjoy that aspect of it, but other people, uh, I believe that there was, I guess, a marketing misconception where the game looked like it was targeted for a younger audience than it really uh, was. Oh, uh, no, okay. so I can, they I can changed the maybe, colors yeah. a little bit. Yeah, uh, the colors now look a little bit more like on the pastel side, which right. I, I actually kind of like. I kind of like it. I guess it has a more of a marine lifestyle color palette to it. Yeah, uh, only grown-ups like pastels. That's that's really how this. Yeah. Oh yeah. Pastels too. So so yeah. As far as I know, that's it. I don't believe there's any changes to the rules um, or any other significant changes there. That is there funny is though. Thing, no, go ahead. There is one thing I did want to change in, mm -hmm. in the rules. It's super super minor though. But uh, in the game, you start off with three uh, currencies. So you just have like three dollars. Right. To spend. And I would have liked to have it make be four dollars instead, and not because that I think that the players need that extra dollar to be able to acquire more cards, but because everything in the game is based on the number four. Right. <laughs> so the boards are four by four grids. Right. Uh, you can only have up to four cards in your hand. The uh, the corals themselves can only be four high, and so everything revolves wow. around the number four. So it's it's sort of like the like the concept of symmetry right. is kind of in play there. So everything, that way it was so easy to remember anything. It's like if, some, if someone asks, well, how four, high four, can four. it be? Four. How many cards can I have in my hand? Four. So as long as I, I can make everything consistent, right, it, it'll just be subconsciously easier to remember all the little nuances. It's, so I've been actually trying to do that with my other designs too, is that trying to find <laughs> number and just use that number as often as I can to make it uh, as intuitive as possible. That's that's fast. Like you, you just. I feel like I just watched The Sixth Sense and I started noticing everything is red again. It's like, oh my gosh, it is all red. <laughs> it's like, oh, the number four. That's funny. That I, yeah, it, it's one of those things that a designer would notice, you know. But all yeah. of us are like, nah, we just play with three. It makes sense, you know. But, <laughs> but that's funny. That I like. But I like the I like the reasoning for it. It's not just an arbitrary. Nah, I would have rather had this. It's everything's four. You can explain the game. Boom, 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 boom. You know. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. I do like how, I know you gave us the disclaimer, but I love how you phrased that too. I was told that <laughs> this is James, like, the, whose name is on the box again. I'm pretty sure it's yours. <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, some of the publishers have really, really talented, uh, developers that are really, really smart. And sometimes I always wonder, it's like, you know, if they're this brilliant at developing the game, understanding, breaking down the math of the game to tell the designer where the game is unbalanced and where it can be improved, right? Right. That kind of like mindset is like perfect for actually designing games. True. I always wonder why don't they design games? They'd be <laughs> phenomenal at this. Right? That's true. Well, maybe I, I should be thankful. Uh, that they well, don't that's games. right. They're like, no, stay in that developer part. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> But then again, like I've always heard, uh, again, I'm a, I'm a big old school wrestling fan. And so like Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man, he was amazing at calling and designing matches for himself. Mm -hmm. But when it came to other people, he couldn't do it. So I wonder if there's almost like that, I'm really good at developing your game, but I can't mm -hmm. come up with my own game. Not come up with, that's not the way to say it. That sounds pejorative. I mean, I, I can see, maybe it's the objectivity factor. People can be a little bit more objective with someone else's property than they could their own, perhaps. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, that that's definitely, yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely feasible. 
But yeah, I just want to bring up the developers just because yeah. that a lot of times as designers, we do uh, work with developers and sometimes they just make better decisions than we do. Right. Or things you wouldn't uh, even think of, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Un yeah, exactly. Unsung like the, heroes. <laughs> exactly. They are the unsung heroes. So. <laughs> well, it's funny enough because it's like, wait, you you dev you you design board games. What are you, what are you talking about? Then it's like, no, no, no. I, I develop board games. Like, what, do you, <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> Right, right. The next level of like, I've never heard of that before. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Oh, that's awesome then. So, okay. Old school gaming though. Let's go, let's go back to old school video gaming. Are you, right. were you an NES guy? Or are you, uh... Yeah, I had an NES. Okay. But... I had NES, uh, Super NES. Uh, I guess I was always Nintendo and Sony. That's right. So I didn't get much into the Sega products though. Uh -huh. so... I had a Dreamcast for Marvel vs. Capcom and that's it. And then it finally ported it to the PlayStation 2 so I was really happy that... Uh... Right, right, yeah, yeah. So, how about yourself? Uh, you, yeah, you retro game. Nintendo all the way, man. I, I'm, I'm waiting for a perfect Mega Man board game. Like that's what I want in my life to be complete. Uh -huh. Is Mega Man. Uh, love, love, love Nintendo. I had, you know, 64. Uh, no, my first was NES and Super Nintendo. We played, gosh, we played Super Punch Out for hours and hours and hours, oh. probably hundreds of hours into Super Punch Out. So, uh, and of course, regular Punch Out, which I've still to this day never beat ever. Just, it's impossible, is why. So. Yeah, Mike Tyson's. Yeah, it, he throws one punch and you're you're done. Like it's dude, yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I do feel like there were some angry developers or designers back then. They're like, no, 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 you can't beat our game. That's the whole point of this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, back then, the selling point, like when I look at the back of a box or or uh, or a video game, like my purchasing decision was heavily influenced by how long uh, the game takes to complete. Right. So I remember looking at, okay, if I had a choice between a game that took 30 minutes to a game that takes like four hours, I was heavily favoring the one that takes four hours right. back then because we wanted something that killed all that spare time that we had. That's it. Yeah, you want to chew through the time instead of like, oh, we're done in a half hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh... Now, now, now it seems like it's the, the quite the opposite because now, uh, back then, we didn't have the, or at least I didn't have like the disposable income to have right. multiple games. Like I had to make a a firm decision okay i can only buy right. one game That's for this it. whole summer so i want a game that lasts as long better as be possible. good <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we, if it wasn't good i just wanted to last long we got skunked on that a couple times we we're like oh this looks amazing oh no we just wasted 70 bucks because i think my brother paid 90 dollars for mario 3 when it came out it was in that really high range or something like that it's like that's crazy that is nuts that's nice, but Mario Three is a really good game. Oh, that's that's my favorite of the Mario's. I think that or Super Mario, uh, the, the Super Nintendo one. But I love Mario Three. Mm -hmm. But it is funny though the difficulty of games back then and now games now like like a Bloodborne or um, what's the other Dark Souls that are Dark legitimately Souls, yeah. hard. It's like yeah, yeah, but that's how all games used to be. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. The games used to be incredibly difficult. Uh huh. I'm I'm 33, so at the yeah. time of the NES playing uh, there. If I found them, I think they're at my mom's house still. I'm pretty sure there are teeth marks in my NES controller. I was like, oh! you know, because <laughs> I was an immature kid and I got mad. I bit the controller. I was never a thrower, but there were those quiet moments. Where I was like, come on, yeah, yeah. Like ridiculously hard, you know. And there was yeah. no save game states. It was <laughs> you're done. Exactly. It was three Start lives, That's and it. then once you went through them, right? Unless you knew the up down, you know, up down, up, right. down, left right, up right, B A start select. Or select start right. to get your 99 lives. Otherwise, <laughs> you had three lives to go through the entire game. And once you lost your third life, it was back to the beginning. That's it. Yeah. And so, yeah, especially think of like uh, like Mega Man 2, we probably pump more into. But thankfully, they did have the password system. But games that, that didn't have a password system, it's like, oh, you just start over. You're, you're done. But that was yeah. the weekend. We would do that all weekend long. I mean, yeah. just my brother and I would play all the time. Yeah. But, uh, which brings us to my favorite. Somebody asked the other day. They had a, had a nine by nine or three by three grid. I guess no, it might have been five by five. And it was like if you could only pick three of these franchises, and and most of them were newer franchises because I think it was a younger ish person putting them up there. But it was okay. like Bioshock, Metal Gear Solid, Mega Man. I was like, boom, those three right there. That's that's what I want. So, <laughs> right, yeah. uh, which brings us to we've got to talk about Metal Gear Solid. Like you you have sure. you you've made. Made or making? I mean, I, I mean, there's prototypes and stuff right actually, that exist, but yes, actually, worst one of the things that we were in the middle of doing was uh, massive playtesting. So we were going to send out playtest kits and everything like that 
uh, and try to get as much of the feedback. Uh, one of the things I've mentioned um, was that I've done a lot of playtesting, but it was with the same, or generally the same set of people, so right. probably like two or three different playtest groups, and they've gotten really good at the game. <laughs> so I tweaked, So I think I may have tweaked the difficulty for a very savvy player. So what we were going to do, <laughs> our next step was to actually send out uh, playtesting. So we're, we're going to do more playtesting with each of the scenarios. There's lots of scenarios, so I know that it was going to be a good amount of playtesting that was going to be needed to make sure that each scenario was balanced and balanced for uh, someone coming in that was going to be fairly new to the game or has right. maybe have a couple of games under their belt. Not with, we didn't want to tune it to someone who's played the game 50 yeah. times. Like, right? why is this game so hard? <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the game is, you know, uh, at the time that I submitted it, the game was actually fairly difficult. So I wanted to make sure that it was going to be still accessible and still be a good experience. And uh, if anything, I would probably lean a little bit towards making it a little bit easier because mm -hmm. I think that there's going to be a lot of buyers, uh, consumers of the game, that are going to be new board gamers. Yeah, right? absolutely. I, I, absolutely. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that there's going to be a lot of people who would purchase a game just for the IP because of the mm -hmm. strength of the IP itself. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of tune it to make sure that it's going to be a good experience regardless of how savvy you are with board game mechanics and understanding you know, what's the optimal decisions and and things like that. So we were we were in that process, and that's where we kind of gotten uh, a little Side bit delayed. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got a little bit delayed on that. Uh, so, but uh, past couple of weeks, I've been uh, we've kind of been picking up the pieces and uh, trying to move forward on getting that testing done, getting more uh, uh, play testing and development done, balancing and things like that. So we're, the project is is still it's moving forward, but we had a bit of a break. Uh, in the progress. Oh, that makes me so happy. I, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm as a reviewer, I try to be a little bit more objective. But man, I'm beyond, <laughs> I'm so excited. Like I cannot, I, I cannot. <laughs> that's my favorite games. Like, but it's funny you say that though, because people know that I'm a, a board gamer who don't really play as much. But mm -hmm. when that was announced, I got multiple texts like, "Did you see this?" You know, and I was like, "Yeah, absolutely." Yeah. So it's gonna get it's gonna get people in, man, who who played the game for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just need a Vulcan Raven miniature on in my life. Like, I just need it sitting on the desk with the big uh -huh. cannon, like, you know, that's what that's oh, what you're I gonna do. love this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's phenomenal. It looks it looks fantastic. Yeah. And you're gonna get like a the Metal Gear figure about like that dude. That's awesome. At, those are the type of things that like push the definition of what a miniature is. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's like this is a full like hey, it's my hand. It's not a miniature. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's everyone gets a full one to one scale Metal Gear Ray uh, Rex. Yeah, so you just hop yeah. in and ride it around. It's amazing. Yeah. The pre order system is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> you get to ride in it. <laughs> oh man, it's nine volts. You know. <laughs> it is. It is crazy to me. Like so in Metal Gear Solid, they're like it's got a rail gun snake. You know, and it's like. To me, that was sci-fi as a kid, right? Yeah. The idea of rail yeah. guns and like, but then I, I don't even know if I should tell this because like they were like, "Hey, this is pretty secret." But we we did a show at a church in uh, in Virginia, and they were like, the the pastor's wife was like, "Hey, I work at this base. Would you like to come see the rail gun?" I was like, "What did you just say to me?" I was what? like, "What?" <laughs> so that's where the uh, I think the army had it, the project. Yeah, yeah. Navy's working on it now. And she was like, yeah, you can come see it. We might be firing that day. I was like, Poof. they weren't firing that day. I was very disappointed. They were not firing that day. Oh. But, um, man, it was. she gave me a she gave me a shell uh, or a, a piece of armament from it. So I was like, I, the whole time I was like, this is literally on Metal Gear. Like, this is what goes on on Rex or Ray. Like, they're, they're launching new stuff. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm a, I was so pumped, dude. So I just... Um, wow, that is exciting. Yeah, so I was... I've always been a Metal Gear fan, so I'm looking forward to the game and... and uh, as it uh, as it just continues on with that process of tweaking and making it easier for people like me who aren't like, gosh, this is so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm I have to say I'm really really grateful that IDW has been uh, very very open to just uh, you know allowing me to kind of express the vision that I have mm -hmm. for the game. So I'm super excited because I have you know uh, I came into this and like you asked in the very beginning, it's like, did you start from the beginning or did you right. look at the end? And like I had as a Metal Gear fan, you know, I said, okay, if I was a hardcore Metal Gear fan, which I am, sure. this is the kind of game I want. This is what I want to see in the game. And so like I figured, you know, I'm gonna send I'm gonna share that vision. And actually Spencer, who was working on the project, who came up with the original vision mm -hmm. about it, 
we actually saw eye to eye in that his vision document and what I had envisioned for the game were very much along the, the same lines. And so when I everything, you know, I, I had my whole, uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say pitch perfect, like my design document, right. how I wanted to approach this game, you know, I definitely pulled the stops and I said, you know, this, I'll let IDW like rein me in and say, no, that's not feasible. We got to pull you back a bit. Right. But surprisingly, they have been incredibly accommodating. That's good. That's so good. I am super happy because, and, and, I, and I do feel bad that like I have, I really did just, just throw the kitchen sink and everything. <laughs> like, I want all of this. In fact, I want I want buttons that press where the voice actors say their lines. Like, right, right. Snake! <laughs> yeah. Well, I was able to, uh, they allowed me to include the entire story of the Metal Gear Solid game, which you know, I fell in love with Metal Gear Solid because of that story. Absolutely. I absolutely loved it. So I was so appreciative when they allowed me to actually retell the entire story of it. That's awesome. That is so yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the part where you get to play where Naomi's like, by the way, I'm slowly killing you. It's like, what are you doing? Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, oh, let's see. All the twists. All oh. the twists. All the plot twists are in there. It's like, that is such... It, I, uh, Kojima's like mind is just like... Boom, especially with one was amazing. Then two, it's like yeah. even bigger. Three is probably still everyone's favorite. I like one the yeah. best, but like three was so emotional there we go yes. there's another topic emotions in gaming actual emotions yes. not like hey let's get this done and pay us and we'll do a yearly game or whatever but like you legit are like <sighs> tearing up a little bit at the end of the yeah. uh, three yeah. or something like that. So exactly cool. yeah i mean it was yeah three was definitely like between one and three i always have a hard time uh because they're both story-wise they're both phenomenal both both phenomenal so yeah and my Really, my goal for the Metal Gear, I wanted to do well enough to so that we can actually do Metal Gear Solid 2 and Metal Gear Solid 3, especially 3. Oh, yeah. Because I would love to do a camouflage system in a board game. Well, I was going to say, I'm currently playing the scene where you're fighting against the end, and it, it'll happen. It'll keep going on for yes. a, a good six months now. <laughs> <Just wait there. laughs> well, no, actually, if it, if it goes on six months, right? Yeah. This is a really interesting thing is that there there's so much little Easter eggs in uh, the Metal Gear series. Right. If uh, And you could do this with uh, Metal Gear Solid 3. If you just set your system clock or if you just don't play for like a certain period of time yeah right? when you get to the end he's already he's dead, dead right he <laughs> old age it's amazing all these super little details are just amazing in that game it's well in like even back then uh in, in one he's uh psycho mantis is reading your mind he's like put your controller yeah. on the ground and me and my brother were like what's about to happen right now and he's yeah. like oh i see you've been playing sweet coden and i was like that's a that's like a, a a really obscure JRPG. Like, how did he know we were playing? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, the little things. The first like time that. You, you encounter that, it, you freak out because you're not expecting it. You don't know yeah. what's going on. You know. Yeah, he's talking it's to great. you, the gamer, not you, Snake. Exactly. And it's like this is weird. Like that was, yeah. that was so cool. Yeah, there's there's lots of fourth wall breaking moments in the game. It's fantastic fourth wall breaking before it was cool to break the fourth wall that's exactly that's yeah <laughs> oh my gosh so somebody asked me said brian what is your favorite emerson game and it's funny because i i honestly let me see let me pull up don't, the question don't like emerson's, no. <laughs> i don't like emerson's games at all it's weird no i'm just kidding, <laughs> I'm just kidding. no I, I like this one sounds like a cop-out to say but I love putting together all three centuries. I love the system. And I know that wasn't, like you said, that wasn't the initial, or maybe I'm missing that story up, but you said that it wasn't the initial thought was to do all three separate or together. Yeah. I, lo I think it works so well. Uh, I mean, oh, it's just, right. it works. Like uh, like I said, Century um, New World is one of my go-tos for like introducing people to the concept of worker placement. I think we oh, talked right. about this yeah. before too, like, you could in, you could say, hey, it's like Risk when you're playing, uh, you know, an area control game. Hey, this is like a Monopoly when you're playing an economics game. When you're playing it, worker placement, there's no like, hey, it's like this game you played growing up. There's really not a, 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 a analog to that. So I always try to find great games to introduce people to uh, worker placement, and that's a really good one. Oh, thank you, thank you, and I'm super happy and relieved to hear that like you guys. Do like the the combined game because that was always a big worry. Mm -hmm. Is that you know we this is something that you know we we didn't have that the end vision for it when right. we started. So this is one example where we didn't know what it was going to look like. <laughs> uncharted so, territory. It was, exactly, it was uncharted territory for us. 
And so we had to be like Nathan Drake, and we had to like. Go. I like what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to like find our way. Like, how are we going to do this? So, and I remember that it was. Uh, I was actually quite nervous that I couldn't come up with anything that's going to feel coherent when I put the games together. So we spent a lot, a lot of time trying to develop that. Well, and I don't know if this was uh, early on in the process or not, but I think one of the the best things about it is the mm -hmm. fact that you guys weren't afraid to say, uh, hey, don't use these parts when you're combining them. In fact, take this part out of the game. You know, it's, it, it might be a small thing. It might be a small rack of mm -hmm. cards. It's like, no, no, take this out. You're still playing all three games, but you're going to do it in a, in a way that uses the best parts of all three versus the fact that they're all amazing separate, but here's how you can combine them. Instead of just going, no, you just play all three together. Like there are people who used to play uh, like X-Wing and then Imperial Assault and then Rebellion, uh, like a big game. Uh, oh, yes, yeah. But this is like, no, let's not be afraid of saying, hey, take this out. It doesn't work with this. Let's make yeah. the combined version the best. I, I, all three stand alone really well, obviously, but I just, I like them like that. <laughs> so said now in reverse Emerson what's your favorite Brian pick <laughs> uh, let's see oh yeah uh, now are you a comic guy like comic book guy and all that sort of stuff uh, I used to be okay I used to be uh, back when like image comics started okay. I think around that time when I was into collecting so I was collecting Marvel and then image comics just came out with like spawn number one oh, yeah. and young blood and savage dragon and, and uh, the first round of those so I was into comics at that particular time, so I was probably into comics for about a year or two. And that was a good year to pick, though, considering yeah. like, you're getting Jim Lee at his best, Eric Larson at his best, yes. and everybody's like, "Oh no, just just buy these. They'll save them. Don't touch them. Put them put them in a in a in a." <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I always no. wanted to read them all. Yeah, the '90s had such great great stuff for that. All right, so we got to get a we got to get a food question in here. Uh, all right. Are you a foodie? Do you, do you like food? Do you like I mean, food? I like, Obviously, <laughs> likes food, but I like I like food. Uh, I wouldn't cons I wouldn't call myself a food. Okay. But I enjoy the food. What is your favorite thing to eat at home? I assume you're at home. I don't know. I'm assuming. Yep. What's your favorite thing to eat at home? And also, what's your favorite thing to eat, uh, whether in a restaurant, at a con, etc., or just in town? There, like, what's your favorite kind of food to eat or favorite meal? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, one of the things that I've been really enjoying uh, is cheese. So. Uh, like an aged cheese okay. with uh, some nuts and some dried fruit is something that I've been... And I, and I know it sounds like very foo-foo. No, and, you just heard uh, it here. Emerson is fancier than all of us. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I I love charcuterie, man. I, I'm a big fan of the... Uh, the yeah, the, exactly. So what, know, like so. what kind of cheese are you, are you doing? Is this walnuts? Is this... Uh, you got to get some details here, man. I'm hungry now. Oh. I'm saying this. Okay. Uh, let's see. Like my favorite one is like the aged Dutch Gouda. So uh, Boris Head's got a good one. Uh, but usually I tr I go to the supermarket. And I'm oh I never I can never like navigate my way around like a real cheese store. Right. So I have no idea what any of the things are. Uh, Just walk in and lie. Say, be like, hmm, I don't want that. That looks too unfancy for me. I'll do that. <laughs> So, but I just I just get the stuff from like the supermarket, and if I see any like aged cheese, so they're like the more denser, more flavorful cheeses, just because they've been aged longer. Right. Uh, so I, I definitely tend to enjoy those. Um, I like the the blue cheeses sometimes yeah. as well. So all kinds of different cheeses, but I don't quite have the taste for like the really fine stuff. So <laughs> well, here's, so here's the supermarket the thing, stuff is good for me. Would Emerson, as a twelve year old, if you went to him and you were like, "Hey, dude." I want you to try this cheese and walnut combo. Would he be like, dude, that's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. He would, he would probably say that's disgusting. Yeah. That's, I, my taste has changed so much as an adult yes. than it is as a kid. Like where I think back, I'm like, I would never eat that as a kid. <laughs> yes, exactly. So what exactly. about out, out and about? What do you like to get in restaurants, et cetera? Oh, out and about. Wow. Ooh, I do like a good steak. Yeah. There you go. That's, that's probably yeah. my go-to. Yeah, I do like a good steak, but you know what? I'm I'm not picky. Like I enjoy so many different types of cuisines. I love Indian food, French food, oh, yeah. Italian food, Mexican food, you know, Chinese, Korean, Thai, you name it. I all of the above all. are delicious. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's uh that's I think that's the best part about uh uh, the, the restaurant industry changing so much to where it's like, hey, we want to fill this niche and we want to we want to have these kind of very more craft style restaurants where it's like, dude, there's mm -hmm. so many great things to eat nowadays. It's 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 amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think that might be just like the reason I came to like New York because there's just so, <laughs> such a big variety of food. Yeah, you have everything in the world at that point, you know. <laughs> Uh, that's that's funny. Now, yeah, as far as a sweet tooth, do you what do you, what do you like? What is your go to dessert? Oh, okay. Actually, I don't have too much of a, a sweet tooth, so huh? That's a really good question. Um, hey, some people oh. eat cheese for dessert. I'm not even kidding. I like cheese in a port. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, actually, one of the things we do like is uh, I don't get to have this very often, but like a, a port. Yeah, uh, port wine, just mm-hmm. a little shot of it because I'm a, I'm a lightweight. <laughs> uh, or, or um, Emerson, where did uh, this idea come from? <laughs> <laughs> one of the things, one of the things I have, uh, I'm all out of it now, but I have, I had a couple, I had a bottle over here. Is a Bailey's Irish Cream and uh-huh. a little bit of Kahlua. I would just like mix the two <laughs> and have like this little liquid uh, dessert, that's like <laughs> little cordial glass. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I'd say that. I'd say that's my favorite dessert because I, I, I think I've got I've outgrown like the big bowl of ice cream. I used to right. love just having a bowl of ice cream. Uh, or a piece of cheesecake, but I think I've kind of outgrown that because it's now it's a little too overwhelming for me. But well, having just a shot glass of a liquor or something like that, enjoying that quite a bit. Yeah, it sticks a lot easier too. And well, like that's the thing now too. Like I, I, I try to be pretty health conscious. You know, I like to, I like to be in the gym, lift weights, and all this sort of stuff. Now that like the calories are so big on the back of things, it's like I, I don't want this anymore. <laughs> like, I've, just, I've decided against my life choices forever. Yeah. Yeah. So here's here's one we'll end we'll end uh, the the stream on this we can talk about it. So gaming oh. is is a hobby, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, still work. It's kind of like you said you, you can't really enjoy it as much. I mean, you still enjoy it, but uh, it still feels like work sometimes. I'm the same way when I watch a magic show. But other than gaming and stuff, what what other hobbies do you have? What other things do you enjoy to do to fill time when not working? You know, what's oh, okay. what's the thing you go to? Oh, okay, this is gonna sound super, super geeky and nerdy and stuff like that, but uh, we, I've actually... we do board games. What can sound geeky and nerdy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've actually been trying to brush up on my math programming and three D modeling. Oh no, so, uh, that's legit though. Yeah, yeah, I've actually been I've I've been watching a lot of uh, videos on just like numbers and just like the fascinating world of just numbers permutations quant- in like quantum theory like i have no right. idea how any of this works but i can't understand it but I'm, I'm super fascinated by it so i've been spending a lot of time doing stuff like that just just educating myself on all of these different things and maybe in a way i'm doing it to try to get more inspiration for different kinds of games sure if i if i keep playing games i might just end up making like the same kind of games but maybe if i put my brain in a different sphere Maybe then I can come up with something that's uh, a more unique idea. Well, you heard so. it here first, folks. Quantum Lock <laughs> coming in 2021 by <laughs> It comes with a frozen superconductor. <laughs> Everybody gets one of those. No, but, uh, it's funny that you say that. Um, okay, with the exception of numbers, because my brain is not that good. Like I love math, but like yeah. it overwhelms me a little bit of time. Like I'll, I'll watch videos on like, hey, if you, especially when it relates to cards. You know, if you shuffle yes. cards. Um, if you, if, a, 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 ran, a randomized deck of cards is ten to it's ten times six to no I'm sorry it's eight it's eight times ten to the sixty eight different combinations I believe uh, that a deck of cards could be because it's, it's a fifty two number factorial right but right, right. even the little things like that are are blow or mind blowing to me but um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, we were talking about quantum theory and stuff like that that's like next level kind of stuff but. With the 3D modeling like you're talking about. So I just got into 3D printing and uh, got, yes. I've got a resin 3D printer because uh, for, for miniatures, but also for magic and stuff like that. And that blows me away, just the idea of how you can take something that is essentially on the back end of the computer screen, zeros, ones, et cetera, you know, that being the hyperbole. But uh, right. And then it's like like that Superman, but I, I don't think you can see it from here. There's a Superman bust, a 3D printed and painted. It's like, oh. that, that was just... That was someone's mind, and then put that onto the computer, and then it printed out. That to me is magic. Like this, this whole yeah. idea of resin three D printing. It's it literally looks like magic. You're just like, how does that happen? You know. So, but um, but so you've been brushing up on on your math, your your coding, your designing, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but that it, it's weird when you talk about hobbies. There are people who are like, no, I like to get out in the garden and do that. What seems like work to some people is actually incredibly right. relaxing. Huh. Right, right, right. Yeah. No, that's fun. And you're a dad as well. Is that right? Was that yeah? Yeah, yeah. I got uh, got three kids. So you're chasing them around too, and that's that's also part of the hobby. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 that's that's fun. Yeah, no, I um, I, it it blows me away just kind of hearing 
how different designers talk about the, the, the thing that fascinates most is the design process. So hearing you talk about your design process and I've talked to, to guys like Jamie and, and, uh, and I was talking to Glenn Drover recently. And it's funny, uh, you guys all do different types of games, but you, you have very similar nuggets in the design process, but also vastly different ways of thinking about it. So I, I love, and maybe I just nerd out on this a little bit, but the design process of board gaming is so much deeper than, than we even know as consumers of board gaming. So it's it's so invaluable to get insight from guys like you uh, so that we can hear, you know, what is it you love about a game? I mean, okay, you, can, you don't have to name the game, okay. but has there ever been a game that you were like, Kind of phoned that one in, you know. <laughs> not, not to say that you phoned it all the way in, but there are moments you're like, "Well, I definitely want to tweak that a little bit harder." Don't say the game or anything like that, but are, are there moments you go, oh, "I wish I could have changed that up a little bit"? Uh, I think some sometimes I do, but I always like appreciate that it's not, you know, a product like a game is is a product, and a lot of people have their hands in it, so it's not just right. a designer, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and oftentimes, like the if it goes to the publisher, the publisher saw something in the game yeah. too. So even though like there are some games where I said, huh, I wonder, and I try to, I try to be as objective and I try to, uh, for one thing, I always give the benefit of the doubt to the designers in terms of how they design something. Uh, but if there, if I do see something that is, that I feel is a little bit off, I usually attribute it to, okay, it might be the math, right? Yeah. So there might be just some kind of a slight imbalance. And during their play testing that it, a certain, these certain scenarios may not have come up. Because you know you can only do testing a finite number of times. Right. Uh, well, and how so. many permutations of a uh, not an error, but a um, a difference in scoring can even there be? Like there, uh, countless, right? I mean, essentially, there could be things that, that people will find in games that years later that never came up ever, ever, ever before. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And like you said, like the permutations are always the numbers are always factorial. Right? right. So it's always these incredibly large numbers based on what the uh, initial set of variables are right like how many different actions do you have multiplied right. by how many rounds there are and so forth so you know there could be these astronomically large numbers that's just not feasible and you know one particular permutation can come up in a game where it's just going to feel imbalanced right, right? Just so do sometimes like, i think it's it's more more likely that something like that happens rather than like the designer just had like you know an area where uh, they overlooked something right. or they dialed something and, and so forth. Because like getting designs picked up by publishers, getting publishers excited about your design is just so much more, it's much more competitive now. Oh, absolutely. The designers to where, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine just a designer putting a, a, a half effort into a design right. and, and ship, ship, shipping that off to the publisher where you know, now it's just so difficult that every one of these designs, you want to make sure that they are they are phenomenal designs, at least in your eyes right. and your perception, that they're that they're incredibly good designs, well balanced, and it it uh, achieves the experience that you want the players to have. Right. right. No, and and that's that's actually kind of I, I cheekily said the question, but what I meant by that is exactly what you answered. The fact that you, you, it's never something where you at the end of the day go, oh, I should have done more work than that. But there's probably also moments you're like, man, I, if given if given another month, I would love to do another month's worth of work into it. But as is, great product, happy with it. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. Right. And that's what's that to me. Design process is so fascinating. Just in general, people hear me say that all the time. But like, I, I love the minds behind gaming because again, gaming is different than any other product. I, I do call it an art. I mean, there are a lot of people who are like, well, it's not an art, but it really is because it's just an interactive art. You know, it's it's a delayed form of Performance is what it really is. I mean, if you think about it, or, or a delayed form of um, what is it? visual arts of something like movies, right? Whereas movies, right. you're in the moment at the moment and you're watching it. But this yeah. is like you're coming up with your vision. Mm -hmm. Maybe people will play it in this certain way, or maybe right. people will play it in a different way. And that to me is, just, is is artistic to where you have to create a moment in my mind with my people sitting around me that you've never met before. And right, hopefully, right. hopefully that happens and it hits right, and that right. that's what's so fascinating about gaming. But it also brings people together, unlike anything else. So, which is thankfully what we've yeah. been able to do tonight. You know, hopefully you you all have enjoyed just getting to hang out and watch as Emerson just blows our minds talking about just. And we didn't even get to scratch the surface on all the things I want to talk about with him, but. Uh, but that means we'll just have to have him back on uh, another time and talk, and talk <laughs> more gaming stuff like that. But, um, but but thank you so much, Emerson, for coming on and uh, tell hey plug something. Oh. 
Plug the thing you're most excited about. I know I, I got to talk about the things I was most excited about that you've got coming. <laughs> but oh, okay. but uh, what's the things that you're most excited about coming? And it might be some of the same. I don't know. Okay, yeah. I, I guess uh, um, you know, uh, some people might have already known about these projects, but uh, like Foundations Number Rome, we're really excited about that. We're putting the finishing touches. We're basically putting the bow on the box kind of a thing. We're just uh, uh, making sure that we're crossing our, our we're crossing our eyes and dotting our teeth. Right, right. <laughs> Everybody go to the gym before that comes out. You're gonna need to you need to put on a little yes. bit of muscle to lift it and carry it to the table. <laughs> no. yeah. And you know how I'm super excited about Metal Gear Solid. You know, that's 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 like the dream project. Yeah. Right? So that is like, uh, if anything, that's probably gonna be the pinnacle of my design career is being able, getting the opportunity to do that game. So I'm super excited about that. Well, and, and you I'm show cool. me some of the perks that that brings when you show me that video clip that you show me. Yeah, yes. I was like, yeah, that's an amazing thing. Um, Yes, yes. I, I, I wish I could. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could just show the entire world. Right but it's, it's, that was definitely something personal to oh, me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Dressed to me, it was personal to me. So, but, yeah, <laughs> that was definitely a, a huge highlight. It was a very high moment in my life yeah. to receive that. <laughs> I'm also working on a game with Plan B. So, look for another uh, title with Plan B. It's still early in the works. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's something that we're hoping. Actually, I don't think we have a timeline on that at this moment. Right. Though. What's your what's the weight? Yeah. Ooh, oh, that's a really good question. I think it's going to be. We're trying to get close to the century weight, but it might be a little bit heavier than that. Okay. All right. I like that. Yeah. So those are the, those are the three things that I could say are in progress, and I have a whole bunch of designs. Well, I shouldn't say a whole bunch. I, right. I have a handful of designs that uh, I've been working on that hopefully I'll get publishers. Uh, at some point in the near future. Sure. No, that's great. Well, thank you, Emerson, for coming on. Everybody, go make sure to check out. What's the best place to find you? Are, are you more Twitter? More? What's the best place to find you and kind of find the news, okay. being that you do have? Yeah, actually, I think Twitter. Yeah, maybe Twitter uh, is probably the best place. So it's going to be just at NASCA Games. At NASCA Games. Yeah, there you go. Make yeah. sure to go follow Emerson. Amazing designer, but also just an amazingly nice guy who, uh, who just loves the hobby, loves the games, and all this sort of stuff. So go check out. Definitely go get your hands on those games that are coming out. He didn't ask me to do that. Nobody ever asked me to do that, but I'm plugging it. Go, go, go buy some of that stuff because, my gosh, you're, you're going you're gonna to want to see I saw Foundations of Rome in person. Whatever you can, late pledge, however it's working, go get your hands on a copy of that. Do what you can. Uh, and then and then the other stuff that's coming as well. So thanks, Emerson. Uh, I'm going to hit this intro, this outro, and then we will we'll rock and roll, man. Thanks very much. We'll see you next time. Thank you.